watching this guy, I thought this is why they poisoned and killed Socrates. This is why they hated him <laughs> that much. <laughs> this, I mean, this is why they hated him. Welcome to Talking Beasts from NarniaWeb.com, where we explore the world of C.S. Lewis and keep a watchful eye on the latest Narnia movie news. This is Talking Beasts. Welcome back, everyone. This is Glumpuddle. And this is Rillian. And today we are reviewing The Most Reluctant Convert, a new movie about C.S. Lewis. It releases on November 3rd. This is an early review. <laughs> Either there's no God behind the universe, a God indifferent to good and evil, or worse, an evil God. Do you believe that logic and reason bring forth indisputable truth? I do. And are your moral and aesthetic judgments valid and meaningful? They are. For the first time, I examined myself with a serious, practical purpose. What I found a Hold me. How could a mere man be called a great moral teacher and say the sort of things Jesus said? Such as? And what better opportunity to have back on the show, David Bates, host of Pints with Jack, the C.S. Lewis podcast. David, welcome back. Hey, guys. It's wonderful to be back and to have both of you this time. That's right. And I understand this movie already kind of has a significant place in your family. It does. This was the first movie that my son, Alexander, ever watched. We watched it the oh, day wow. that we brought him back from the hospital. So you did not waste any time on the brainwash, uh, 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 <laughs> whatever you want to call it. I have already explained to him why C.S. Lewis is better than Tolkien, yes. And you're already having the <laughs> theological discussions and the back and forth. Naturally, naturally. Oh, no. Really in showing his Lord of the Rings shirt. You know what? I've got, I'm wearing a Gator jersey because my Gator's lost, so I had to fly the flag. But I was going to. Um, <laughs> wearing my Pints with Jack shirt as well. I, I, I'm a fan. I'm kind of starstruck right now. Oh, my gosh. David Bates is back. Okay. Uh, this is the first time the three of us have spoken since um, seeing the movie. So I'm really excited to hear what you guys thought. Uh, but first, David, why don't you tell the listeners what you're drinking, what this movie is about? Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. Well, if you, you can tell what you're drinking as well, if you want, as is tradition. I'm having mm. Earl Grey. Oh, lovely. I very much approve. Uh, I'm drinking Kid Kolsch, which is a local Wisconsin beer. Uh, but the synopsis. Uh, so the movie basically tells the story of Lois's life uh, up until shortly after his conversion to Christianity in the early 1930s. And it's narrated to us by an older Lewis uh, who is walking around Oxford. And throughout the movie, we see this older Lewis uh, lurking in the background as we see the scenes play out from earlier in his life. And he's uh, got a childhood self that's played by Eddie Ray Martin and uh, a young adult self played by Nicholas Ralph. And the movie begins... Uh, with him walking through the Oxford Natural History Museum, explaining why he was originally an atheist, that he was an atheist because he saw all this death and suffering in the world. And then we have a flashback to his childhood, and it, we then go on from there. We see the death of his mother, the estrangement from his father, his trials at school, he, his time in the trenches of World War I, and his return to Oxford, and then his uh, conversion first to theism, belief in God, and then ultimately to Christianity. And throughout the entire story, because this is based on his spiritual autobiography called Surprised by Joy, uh, the thread throughout is joy, which Lewis speaks about joy with a capital J, these tantalizing glimpses of something which is never fully realized in this world, and which he ultimately concludes are signposts for God. And what's really interesting about uh, the movie is it's uh, the narrator C.S. Lewis, played by Max McLean, is for mo most of the movie, looking right into the camera, talking to the viewer and narrating what's going on and telling you exactly, here's where I learned this, here's where I decided this. Um, and so that's really at least 80% of the movie is Max McLean talking directly to the viewer, uh, breaking the fourth wall, a little bit like Scrooge in the the Ghost of Christmas past scene, I guess, where he's kind of in, inside watching. I was actually going to say, it has, it's very reminiscent of uh, Scrooge or Christmas Carol. Yeah, it's, he's kind of inside his memory. Like occasionally he's separate from it and then we just flash back. But sometimes he's actually there alongside the characters and they can't see him. Um, 
Only thing I would add to that, I guess, is uh, since this is the Narnia podcast, just want to mention the story ends before the writing of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, so we don't we don't get to we don't ever see C.S. Lewis look over to lamppost and go, huh, <gasps> and like get an idea or something. There, there's none of that because it's about his conversion for, for Christianity, which of course uh, was uh, over years before uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But if you do watch this movie, you'll see many of the influences that ultimately find their way into the Chronicles of Narnia. Absolutely. And there are a couple little winks uh, at the camera, uh, little references to Narnia that maybe we'll talk about later. Uh, Really quick, uh, our expectations going into this. Um, So I saw the play a few years ago in Minneapolis and interviewed Max McLean afterwards. I'll include a link to my interview in the description. Um, And I enjoyed the play for what it was. You know, it's a one man show. The play is a one man show. It's just Max McLean on stage, essentially this one hour monologue. Uh, you're almost everything coming directly out of uh, Surprised by Joy and there's some stuff from The Problem of Pain I think and God in the Dock he kind of uh, compiles all this stuff together into something of a narrative which I thought that was it was just pretty cool that someone did that I kind of saw it as not just entertainment but just kind of as a resource it's cool that someone brought it all together in this kind of really uh, cohesive succinct way and then did it as theater then when I heard they were doing a movie, I kind of my first thought was, well, I guess this is their pandemic project. You know, they're they're, they're, <laughs> there's com- they're coming up with a fancy way to record the play. Essentially, that's kind of what I assumed it was. Um, how about you, David? What, what's kind of your experience with this uh, going into the movie? Like you, I had also seen the play. I had really enjoyed it. And so when they announced that they were doing the movie, I was well, I was firstly just really pleased that they were still able to do something that they were uh, that they were using this time to. Uh, produce a new resource, as well as get an awful lot of actors and staff on the cheap because it's COVID and nobody's doing anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was I was very hopeful uh, that they were going to produce something good because the one man play is really well done, and like you, I'd seen the trailer and I was I was impressed. And lastly, Rillian, your experience with this going into the movie? I didn't really know what to expect. I knew that the most reluctant convert was a one-man play. I think I didn't realize how short it was going to be, but no, I thought it was going to be like a two, three-hour thing or something. But Yeah, it's only like 73 minutes. And then I... So I had a very mild interest in it. Um, and then... I, but I thought it was going to be like a one-man monologue, like watching one man... Like a video version of the play, basically. Like you just film it, you know? And then... I, but then I, I learned... Uh, which I don't know if you want to talk about it now but like a friend someone i know a friend of mine was actually playing a role in it so i thought oh okay this is more like maybe a docudrama there's at least it, two men <laughs> yeah i actually thought yeah i thought well and it, i thought maybe this will be kind of like beyond narnia which is sort of a docudrama uh that came out a number of years ago but i had no i had not seen the trailer i had oh wow uh no expectations whatsoever for any good production values other than well i assume it'll be filmed in hd or 4k so <laughs> and that was pretty much i had no expectations i don't want to say low expectations i really had no expectations wow that's pretty special especially compared to me and david just to go into something and not have even seen the trailer or the play or anything um yeah 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 and i think uh wow that must have been quite a quite a surprise um I um yeah I think you you use the word docudrama and that probably is the first thing to kind of explain to you know listeners that haven't seen it is that if you hear oh it's the most reluctant convert it's a movie about uh, C S Lewis um I mean it's you should know right right away it's not the Tolkien movie it's not Shadowlands it's mm-hmm. not like a dramatic it's not really a proper dramatic retelling of C S Lewis's life it's more like a docudrama with this big theatrical flair to it I, I would say as someone who loves Shadowlands. It, it is refreshingly not Shadowlands. Oh. I'm not, I do like the movie Shadowlands, but if you're someone like, oh, well, I've seen Shadowlands. No, no, no. This is completely different. This is it's a different chapter in his life. It's a completely different type of uh, storytelling and different phase of his life that really does not get much attention Yeah, um, in many ways. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I think it is important to kind of have those expectations. Um, and speaking of expectations, uh, so really, and having not seen any of the trailers or anything, I'd really be curious to hear what you thought of that opening scene, because the movie opens with Max McLean playing himself. You see Max McLean in the makeup chair. They're putting his C.S. Lewis wig on and touching him up and yada, yada. And they say, OK, we're ready for you on set. And he walks on. He starts walking to the set and you see that everybody's getting ready to film. He sits in the chair and they go, OK, ready and action. And he looks up and all of a sudden he's in character as C.S. Lewis and for the remainder of the movie. 
you know, he kind of walks you around and boom, it starts. So, uh, really, and what were, what were your thoughts when it started with Max as someone that had no clue what to expect? Yeah. 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 What were your thoughts on that? Well, I, I went in knowing it was going to be based on a play and that was kind of it. I really liked it and he, and I thought it was extremely effective partly because when you're watching a, a film it's almost like huh is this a film or is this footage of a real event well I won't know until I see more than a few seconds of this right is this a newsreel or a fake newsreel and it's almost like with film it's asking you to say it's like it's inviting itself to say hey this is real just really really believe in it and with a play a play comes where like they're right there in front of you and plays give you more have more license to do certain tricks, right? You could have a doorway just standing in the middle with no walls around it, just a doorway in the middle of the stage and someone walks through it. You don't think it's weird because it's a play, right? Yeah. And uh, the fact that it started with Max McLean in the makeup chair and then he walks on and because it's going to be breaking the fourth wall anyway by the style because he's talking directly to you. I thought it was a really effective way of inviting the audience to basically say, this is a storytelling of a real person's life. And it kind of invited the audience into kind of jump into the story more because you're not scrutinizing it the same way. Because you immediately start off with, this is someone pretending to be Lewis. And it admits that the same way a play admits it. Whereas with a movie, there's that little trick in your mind where like, it's like, this is supposed to be Lewis, but it's not really. Yeah, you, you expect it to be really real when you're watching a movie, generally. It gives itself permission to talk directly to the audience and to say, this is a, we are storytellers, this is a story. It kind of just sets the context for the rest of the story. I, I thought it was great. It didn't dis- I didn't think it distracted me at all. I thought it was very well done. How about you, David? Your reaction to that opening scene of Max McLean playing Max McLean playing C.S. Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it in the trailer. In the trailer, I, it, it really got me jazzed up for the movie. Uh, part of else, seeing you know groups of people doing things, and you know they, were, they weren't surrounded by lots of masks and pandemic equipment. Uh, and particularly when he then sits in the chair, and you see his his face rise up to face the camera. There's quite a famous picture of Lewis, and he nailed it. It was really, really eerily similar so i loved it in the trailer i wasn't quite such a fan of it in the movie using this as a framing device hmm. personally i could have skipped that okay like that you felt like it t- took you out of the movie or it uh didn't i didn't usually see the point of it uh, it, when, when it's a trailer it's hey we've been making this movie and it's all building up to you know lights camera action there it made sense to me but in the movie itself not so much i'd have been quite happy with him beginning uh at the point when he starts looking at the camera and then he starts telling his story without going into more detail because we'll discuss it later i think that it i would have not approved of it if it weren't part of a bookend it was actually the bookend that i didn't like but oh, okay okay <laughs> well i will say let's not spoil the other end of this bookend i think since it's literally the very end of the movie let's let's not spoil exactly what those last year that last 60 seconds is um but okay, yeah, for me, um, yeah, I same here. I thought that that opening in the trailer was like, wow, this is really different. This is really cool. I think it did work for me here. Um, it just said, hey, this is a this is someone performing C.S. Lewis. That's what this is. Um, and I think I would have held it to that. I guess I, mean, I just echo everything really and said. I guess I held it to that higher standard of realism. Like they're saying, hey, this is a a. We've taken bits of Lewis's life and we're kind of uh, portraying them, but it's not meant to be completely realistic. You know, it's this sort of so I think they kind of gave it permission to do that. Um, And I just thought it was fun. What I did like about it was it was a nod to the history of this project, that this began life as a stage play and it was now transitioning to the silver screen. That night, as I read Fantasties, my imagination was baptized. The rest of me took a little longer. Okay, I'm just dying to know, just overall, what did you guys think of it? Uh, let me start with you, David. Uh, you know, because we're kind of in a similar place as far as we, we saw the plague, we're familiar with Max, yada, yada. What, what, what are your reactions to the movie overall? Well, to balance off that slightly negative beginning that I had a moment ago, I loved it. I really enjoyed it because you have this older Lewis walking around Oxford and you see all of the sites. If you visited Oxford, it just takes you right back there. Again, 
the pandemic has meant that a lot of us haven't got to go places that we would like to have gone. And one of the places I was meant to have been in this past year is Oxford. So it was lovely to be able to see the Natural History Museum. I think it was the Whitehorse Pub that he goes into, the Kilns, Addison's Walk, all Black of these, Wells. all these places. It was it was yeah. just delightful to Bridge basically size. go on a walking tour with C.S. Lewis as he told you about his life. Yeah, because but by the way, both of you have been there before, and I have not. Um, so more uh, <laughs> you need to go, dude. I mean, it's... You mean the whole thing wasn't just a green screen? I thought that was all CGI. <laughs> like what? What? No, really in uh, verdict on the most reluctant convert movie. The production values are as good as anyone would would do it. I think um, maybe a couple t- things. If I were to be really really critical, maybe a couple points on the editing, but even things like the music. I, like I, I thought, mm. I really like this music. I looked it up. The the I own some of the music by this music composer. He's done a number of other films that I've seen, and I own some of it. Um, yeah, no, I thought uh, it was very well done. And uh, I love the Anthony Hopkins Shadowlands. But everyone who's spent any amount of time looking at uh, C.S. Lewis's life or looking at photos of him knows that, that that's not what he looks like. This guy, it's amazing how much he looks like C.S. Lewis and how much he, I mean, we don't have a lot of footage of him. I, I've heard some audio, uh, with this audio of Lewis reading. Yeah, no, I thought it was, I thought it was great. It's a fan, it'd be a fantastic introduction. If you want to know a little more about just his, his spiritual journey, uh, I liked that the focus, I did like the focus was as kind of narrow as it was like that first part of his formative years uh as an atheist and then a theist and then becoming a christian it's very interesting because a lot of times when people have done like movies and stuff even like the beyond narnia like goes to like that one goes up to like the month before he dies actually um and so you don't spend a lot of time on some aspects of it uh certainly i liked how it elaborated on different relationships he had with owen barfield everyone knows about cs Lewis and tolkien um but there's other people that brings in who uh deserve credit no i thought i thought it was great um i can elaborate on anything you want uh but no i i highly would recommend it especially because it is so short uh it's 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 a great it'd be great uh fodder for discussion if you you know and i don't think it's a huge deal that doesn't talk about cs Lewis because w- being what it is, I think that you're going to not have a lot of people going to seek it out to watch it who don't already know who C.S. Lewis is. Or at least a friend who's dragging them. <laughs> exactly. And the friend will say, oh, by the way, this is about the author of the Narnia books movies. And oh, OK. Yeah, th- th- that's what you need. I don't think you can just go into this and say, well, let's see what movies have released this week. Uh, Most Reluctant Convert. No clue what that is. OK. I'll, and if you pop into the theater, I think you're going to be really confused. I think you have to have some context of who C.S. Lewis is a little bit. Um, so I think that is important to keep in mind. But with that context in mind, um, so I think overall, like, I think it has a really good start. I, re- I really like the first 20 minutes or so. It, it moves really fast. Um, it's cut pretty tightly. Is the play about the same length? The play is almost identical, scene for scene. What about the dialogue from the other, like with Owen Barfield and Lewis talking and or talking? How does that come in? Is it just described in the other play or? Yeah, no, th- that's, mo- that's mostly new. The, the, comp, the anything where Lewis is speaking to somebody else uh, is is by and large new in the play. Sometimes Max will take on the voice of his father, but I don't recall that conversation that he has with with Barfield in particular. But I was really pleased they added it because it's really important to Lewis's story. Yeah, so it is pretty much word for word from the play, with just a few little additions here and there. Um, so I thought uh, I thought the first 20, 30 minutes or so were pretty solid. And uh, it's like it moves along really fast. And I like that opening. And Max McLean does a just good job. He pretty much carries the whole movie on his shoulders. You know, I mean, just looking at the camera talking. And uh, I enjoyed a lot of the scenes we get to see that um, haven't been dramatized before. The more kind of... Um, uh, obscure moments in Lewis's life, like the bit where, you know, oh, my father, you know, the way he could talk and the bit where uh, Warney <laughs> thinks that he was done talking and so yeah. he goes back to reading his book. That's little things from Surprised by Joy that you never thought would make it into a movie someday. I was so pleased by that scene. It was so delightful. Uh, just as a, where, you know, Lewis is describing how his father could talk and talk and talk and then it, it c- c- kind of cutting between adult Lewis describing it and an actual scene of Lewis's father lecturing his two sons and 
that comedy was pretty good. And then Warney thinks that his father is done, is done speaking, goes back to reading his book. Anyway, that's something I remember from Surprised by Joy. It was fun to see that portrayed on screen. Um, I do think the movie kind of loses steam about halfway through and it starts to settle into this very repetitive, very predictable pattern where it's Max McLean walking down some kind of a hallway with a camera backing up to follow him. And he says, and then I wondered, no, there's no way there could be a god. Then you show the flash, the flashback scene where he's having a conversation with somebody. And Max McLean says, then I realized maybe there could be a god and starts walking down another hallway. And so (laughs) I think about halfway through, it's like that pattern go, that that pattern is, um, you just kind of realize where it's going. I will say as as someone who has, uh I spent probably about, my little over maybe six months of my life in Oxford. And it's, it's the way it's edited together visually works great, but somehow it's like, he's just jumping around every scenic <laughs> part of the city. Like, Oh, that's the, that's the bridge of size. And then, Oh, he's over by the turf tavern. And Oh, that's over by new college. All of a sudden, Oh, that's model. And like he rounds a corner and he's a different part of the city. Well, so, he's clearly traveling by wardrobe. <laughs> exactly exactly but, between uh, the worlds maybe. which visually it it works fine especially if you have no idea where any of these things are but it was sort of a little funny so uh although i do think it, it loses steam halfway through um as a fan of c.s lewis meaning his works and you know i have an interest in his life um i had fun with this the production values are pretty solid and uh so i'd say as a fan i enjoyed it for what it was but again as a recommendation i you know uh, I probably am not going to recommend this to someone that doesn't have a just a very basic knowledge of Lewis. If you know that, oh, he was this famous Christian writer. He wrote Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You know, okay, you got to at least kind of know that. But uh, it, and if it's like, oh, and someone, are you interested in like, kind of learning more about the nuts and bolts of his conversion story? Because boy, does it get into the weeds. You know, it's incre- extremely philosophical. I got it's only seventy three minutes, but I got mental. It's mentally draining after a while because it's just all <laughs> the philosophy and. All the stuff being really, really thrown at you, it gets kind of, you know, it gets a little overwhelming. But so as a, as a fan of C.S. Lewis, uh, I, I enjoyed this for what it was and appreciated the product, the production values. So I, I would give it a thumbs up kind of with that kind of asterisk. I do think it is intended for fans of C.S. Lewis. Yes. And I'd also say it'd be a wonderful introduction if somebody's planning on reading, say, Surprised by Joy. If they watch this movie first, it will it will give them lots of visual imagery so that as they go into the book, it'll it, it'll hang together a little bit more. Because that was actually the first Lewis book I read as an adult and I stalled on it. I didn't finish it the first time. But I think if I had watched this movie before, uh, I think I would have persevered a little bit more. It, it is basically, uh, 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 you know, almost probably 90% of it comes... Mm-hmm. practically word for word from surprised by joy and so that is basically like a an abridged version an abridged an abridged and visual version of that i wanted to ask uh, you guys and especially you david because you you spend so much quality time outside of lewis's narnia books uh i mean one thing that was refreshing is because it's it's someone else basically just being lewis talking uh, as lewis describing very intimate parts about his spiritual journey and what's refreshing is there's so many, it's just constantly, it's like Lewis, 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 Lewis. Maybe, maybe it's not all from one book, but maybe it's from other, pulled in from other books. Yeah. And I couldn't, nothing, at least on the first viewing, struck me as, nah, that was, that was, no, they, they just ad libbed that. Or, because it's right. It's it, because it's all Lewis, you know? Yeah. It's yeah, all, I, I mean, is there anything that, is there any, any amount of substantive dialogue that's not C.S. Lewis in this? I think that you know, they had to imagine a couple of conversations, like the ones with the people who would later become Inklings. But at the same time, they can reconstruct a lot of that from right. Lewis's extensive letter writing. And again, I think that's one another reason for the opening with showing Max McLean. It just kind of it just sort of pulls the, the curtain back and says, "What we're seeing is this." Um, dramatized version you know it's not like they had this conversation it's just that no but we're showing a visualization that conveniently they all say the right things at the right time and the way lewis kind of says it in the book um so it's just kind of telling you that's what this is it's a visualization of the book one thing i did want to say that i thought was wonderful in this movie the uh younger actors and the young lewis you know it's oh yeah young actors and notoriously horrible he was wonderful i really liked him Yeah, yeah i think all the actors are really good I was a little bit relieved because he talks about it. Some parts do progress very, very quickly. Like it says, and then I was a fellow or then I was accepted to Oxford University. I started studying there and I'm watching like, uh, but he studied at university college and that's modeling college in the background and then like within the same sentence like, he rounds the corner 
and then I was accepted as a fellow at Modeling College. Like, oh, okay. Well, that is Modeling in the back. So like, it's like he goes like within like 20 seconds from studying to becoming a fellow at Modeling College, you know. The, 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 the thing moves pretty quickly, uh, for sure. But the book does that. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I do think it's important to keep that context in mind of, hey, this is for fans of C.S. Lewis. I think if you if you were to do this as a, I, I know that it's for fans of C.S. Lewis. At the same time, I did feel myself wanting them to do certain things. Like there might have been some missed opportunities. Like I would have loved to have seen the Max McLean character be maybe grow into less of kind of a neutral voice narrator and more getting emotionally involved in what he's seeing. You know, again, to bring the Scrooge example back, you know, Scrooge in the Christmas Carol will see visions of his past and you'll see his reaction to them. And he'll get emotionally involved in them. Whereas what we're seeing in the movie here is a C.S. Lewis that is like, it's almost like he's already written surprised by joy. Yeah. He's already processed through it. And now he's giving it to you. I would have loved to have seen him. Oh, this is me working through it now and having, a more of an emotional reaction to it, to some of these, maybe especially the memories that are painful. One thing that I think they were somewhat limited by, and I don't, I don't know what decisions they made on the casting. The, the actor who plays not child Lewis, but the, the young man Lewis does, I thought a very good job. Um, they're very dependent on him through what would have been really like his teenage and between and it's a large span of his life, it's maybe 15 years. So it kind of distorts a little bit. Like I did have to remind myself, okay, when he was with Kirkpatrick, it, he would have been still much younger than this guy. Yeah, it, it, it's it's those sorts of sorts of points when he's at when he's at school. At some points near the end, he seems a little bit too young, and uh, then when he's talking to his father, he seems a little bit too old. But honestly, I don't know how you could really get around that. I mean. I haven't gone back and checked the chronology, but it does just seem a little bit off. But what would you do apart from add yet another Lewis actor? And I, I think that would be too distracting. Yeah, and I think that's where, and maybe it's not necessary in this front, but I just felt like, hey, it's just felt like since this is for C.S. Lewis fans, that's the primary audience, having that opening with Max McLean putting on the makeup and stuff, it's a way of saying, this is a work of art, okay? He's just going to tell you up Stop front. nitpicking, nerds. <laughs> Shut up, <laughs> you podcast people. Gosh, just eat your popcorn, okay? And by the way, really, you mentioned, you know, Kirkpatrick. Patrick, and that was just something I enjoyed seeing. Like, oh, it's neat to see an actor portraying a, a someone like Kirkpatrick. Who would ever thought it that is. he would be in a movie? A movie. I, just, I thought that was really fun. Yeah, and that's and I I love. It's only been done, to my knowledge, I think twice. And that Beyond Narnia had a, an actor for Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. Oh, me. never mind then. Okay. And I think it's been well, done no, before. I, I like this guy, and it. I mean, those people. And I had a guy who's a friend of mine who actually recently passed away. Uh, who was very much like the same type of guy. You you would make any statement, uh, <laughs> no, really, it could be any theological position, and he would destroy you, just destroy you. And I remember, I mean, I'm watching this guy, and I thought, this is why they poisoned and killed Socrates. This is why they hated him <laughs> that much. <laughs> this, I, they, this is why they hated him. Uh, but if you've seen Beyond Narnia, watch this. It's, this is better than that. And I did like Beyond Narnia. Because uh, that one kind of did, and this person pitched in, and this person pitched in, and this person pitched in. This does a better job, I think, showing, I think accurately, that these people had extremely powerful influences on Lewis's life, without which, who knows what would have happened. Yeah. When you look at, okay, without Kirkpatrick, without Tolkien, without Owen Barfield, without all these profound influences on his life that Lewis gave incredible credit to. I think it's hard to imagine that we would have certainly the literary works that we do, fiction and nonfiction from him. Yeah, I, I think I agree with, with Kirkpatrick in particular. I think you really see like, oh, this is why C.S. Lewis became C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. I totally agree. And the little twinkle in his eye as he's talking about how his argument got ripped to shreds. And he says, other people might not have liked this, but to me it was red meat and strong beer. That's yeah. a great quote. I love it. Great. Uh, so it sounds like we have uh, overall three recommendations here, but but certainly for me with the asterisk, I guess all of us, the asterisk of, you know, if you're a fan of C.S. Lewis um, or, you know, a little bit about him and would like to know more. Oh, yeah. I would add to that or a future fan. Uh, this is the sort of thing that I'm going to show a lot of people. Oh, yeah. uh, any, anyone who uh, asks about what I do and C.S. Lewis, is he that good? It's like, OK, you're coming around tomorrow night, get some popcorn. We're going to watch this and then I'm going to start giving you books. But if it's someone coming in with that attitude still, of just it's not just, you know, watching a movie. It's just mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, I'd be curious to know a little more about C.S. Lewis. This mm -hmm. does, in 73 minutes, it gives you a really nice taste 
of what Lewis, what it's like to read C.S. Lewis and a little bit yeah. about, you know, what, what made the man. And, and this, I've never, I don't know of any, um, I think maybe the Dream of Dar- Narnia documentary gave a nod to George MacDonald, but I don't think gave proper credit uh, to mm-hmm. how much Lewis credits George MacDonald with having any influence on his writing. That's right. Um, and this did a, a good job highlighting George MacDonald as well. I want to actually read fant- fantasies. Now. I know. I I'm going to get that book. I've never read it. I, I, I just, but I want it to be old and beat up like the one he finds in this movie, you know? And, and I did love that scene, uh, both the emphasizing that it was almost purely accidental that he came across this book, uh, mm-hmm. but also when he's sitting in bed at night reading it and you you see him being transported. You mm-hmm. see it changing him in a way that even he doesn't Despite really the distractions, yes. <laughs> that Despite was well, that, well, I bet that was in the play. That was in the play, I bet. <laughs> All right, so I've got a, l- I've a little bit, uh, got a few bits of trivia we just kind of want to mention. Um, I just want to mention uh, that there is a uh, a bit, I guess I won't describe it, I won't spoil it, but there is a a wink at Narnia, I think, where he talk- he mentions going further up and further in. Um, there's also some lampposts, which, hey, lampposts are a real thing in Oxford. It could be just a coincidence, but there's at least one shot where I'm like, oh, that's got to be a Narnia thing. Come on. And then um, I'm glad they didn't here? make it cheesy with like, oh, oh that would be something cool to put in a book. They don't make it cheesy or anything. It's not forced. And uh, we've got the same director as BBC Shadowlands. I didn't know that. Mm. I didn't know that. Norman Stone. He also worked on the screenplay. So of the things that they did change and adapted to the screen, he had a hand in that. Right. Uh, and then we've got a cameo in there, don't we, Rillian? We do. My old friend, my, my friend Spud Ward. We call him Spud because it's his nickname, but I won't say why. But no, Mike, <laughs> Dr. Michael Ward, the author of Planet Narnia, uh, who uh, is a uh, fellow in Oxford, he is uh, gets to play the vicar. And uh, he's... He said he was super duper excited and he, he's a nerd. I mean, he's a Narnia nerd, like professionally. Right. So for him, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. he was super excited, I guess. to be in it. If it wasn't, you know, Dr. Ward getting a cameo, I don't think they would have gotten that big of a close up. <laughs> <It's just> like <laughs> yeah, right here. Yeah, I was like, OK. <laughs> so my wife, she didn't get to see the opening of the movie. She, she wanted to see it. She's like, oh, <laughs> she's like, she's like during that part, she goes, I thought I recognized this person. All of a oh, so you didn't point it out. OK. <laughs> He he actually posted a picture of himself on his Facebook page during the recording. And you know when you're just mindlessly going through Facebook and I was swiping, 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 and then I just like stopped, scrolled back up a little bit. It was just like, I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't normally have hair. <laughs> That's how, yeah, normally he doesn't. That's why they call him Spud. And David, you've got a note in here about the music. Yes. Oh, I was so happy when I heard this. So there's a scene where Lewis is in church. Uh, if you've ever read the screw tape letters, it's reminiscent of one of those letters uh, when he's looking around at what a dreadful experience this is. And the hymn that they're singing is All Things Bright and Beautiful. And the next line of that is All Creatures Great and Small. Uh, and that's a nod to the guy who's playing the younger Lewis because he's in the All Creatures Great and Small remake. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it was it was so wonderful. I was so happy. <laughs> and and also speaking of all creatures, great and small. Yes, uh, Samuel West, who was the BBC Caspian in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he is also in that remake. So let the fan theories begin. <laughs> um, how did how was C.S. Lewis at some point he was a veterinarian and how did Caspian maybe at some point Caspian got into the wood between the worlds or or Aslan said okay I'll give you another glimpse of their world and he inserted him into that time when Lewis was young and becoming a vet hadn't quite decided to go to Oxford yet so let the fan theories begin why is, why is King Caspian and younger C.S. Lewis in the same place well if you recall Caspian brought Narnia under control very quickly after Prince Caspian and that's why he could go on the voyage of the dawn treader so maybe after he'd got narnia in order he traveled to our world to be a veterinarian in yorkshire for a few years and then came back and sought the lords i mean if you're gonna be a king of talking animals you know learning how to be a vet would probably come in handy right i'm just right. hoping that no one writing the netflix series heard you say that <laughs> <laughs> multiverse <laughs> <laughs> well i i often said that uh 
we had the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We needed the British Cinematic Universe. <laughs> with uh, um, we've you know we've had a movie about Lewis. We've had a movie about Tolkien. We get a couple more with uh, Barfield. Maybe Joy Davidman could have a Netflix series, and then they can all come together. <laughs> Well, why don't we brainstorm? Why don't we brainstorm about this in the post show chatter, which will be linked in the description below? Um, uh, the movie is uh, the most reluctant convert. It has a limited theatrical release on November third. I'll click the link in the description for showtime. F- find a way to watch it. Just, just do it. And I, and I, I won't, I won't spoil the ending. Uh, but what I liked, but we will in the post show chatter. Oh, we will in the post show chatter. We can, we, we can spoil the ending in the post show chatter. Okay. That very last uh, scene. Well, I'll just say what I liked about the bookends is the first one says, we're telling a story. And the second bookend says, and it happened. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, that's, I thought it brought it home in a, a great way for me. All right. So uh, we're, there was a, just, yeah, there's that big spoiler we kind of didn't want to include in the main discussion, but link it to our post show chatter where we're going to brainstorm the multiverse and talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> uh, David, would you mind, uh, if you've got the Google Doc open, would you mind reading the outro? Certainly. You've been listening to Talking Beasts, the Narnia podcast from narniaweb.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and give us five stars on iTunes. Post a comment on narniaweb.com or in the Talking Beasts Facebook group. Visit patreon.com slash narniaweb to support this podcast and get exclusive content, including more episodes. Until next time, further up and further in. Further in.